I am Daniel Lucas and welcome to Book 101 Review. Uh, Book 101 Review is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years. And today I have my special guest. He is award winning and he is my feature author of the month. Award winning best selling author, no other than Mr. Sebastian Di Castell. How are you doing? Great, 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 mister. And as usual, can you please introduce yourself? Uh, sure, yeah. For those who haven't encountered me before, I'm Sebastian DeCastel. I'm a Canadian fantasy author. I'm most known for uh, writing swashbuckling fantasy, uh, such as the Great Coat series that began with Trader's Blade and um, a young adult fantasy series called Spellslinger and another one called the Argosy. Uh, and uh, one of my most recent series is um, kind of a dark fantasy called a Malevolent Seven that's full of a lot of irreverent humor and mages going around blowing things up. Um, but Play of Shadows is, of course, a return to my um, very swashbuckling fantasy roots. Yes. So can you give our listeners a brief overview of Play of Shadows? Yeah, Play of Shadows is, <clears throat> as I say, a swashbuckling fantasy set in a city where uh, the theater is deemed to be so sacred that they believe that there are certain actors so talented that when they perform on stage, they are actually able to channel the historical figures that they're playing. In other words, they're not just delivering the lines from the script, but they're actually uh, somehow connecting with the original spirit of, of that figure. So within that world, uh, we have Damalas Shadamantain, who is himself uh, um, a guy who's uh, not exactly heroic, um, who is fleeing a judicial duel, in fact, and he hides out in a theater, in one of these great theaters, um, and he manages to convince the, uh, the, ca the, the actors to let him join uh, and hide out there so that he can avoid a judicial duel. Um, but when he takes to the stage, uh, playing a very minor role, something happens and he accidentally screws up a line so badly that it makes it sound as if the city's most revered hero uh, is actually a murderer and that their most reviled villain might not have been who everyone believed. And that sets off a cascade of events that involve uh, conspiracies and hidden courts and uh, noble sort of councils in the midst of trying to change how the country works and uh, these militias and thugs and everybody ends up trying to kind of want to kill these actors um, to stop them from continuing this uh, play that might actually reveal the truth about what happened in the past. What was the writing process like for this book, Play of Shadows? This one was kind of interesting because when I when I first so it first came to me as an idea. My my favorite way to write fantasy is to uh, is to ask myself the question in our own world: Why do we have the things that we have? For example, the cultural traditions that we have. Why do we have, for example, um, cults of celebrity in the in in our world? Like, why do we revere? Uh, pop stars and actors and famous people the way that we do. And we sort of almost care more about their opinions than we do about the opinions of experts in any given field, right? Um, and so why do we have that, but we don't have other things? And so I, it made me think, you know, well, why is it we have the belief in, in one sort of almost superstitious belief, but not, for example, the belief that, well, what if it, when actors are on the stage, maybe they actually become summon up the spirits of the characters that they're playing and maybe there's something magical happening there and so i like playing with that idea and that became the the kind of the seed from which play of shadows grew and what was unusual <clears throat> about the writing process for this book was i remember thinking i wasn't sure quite how to approach it at first and then i thought i'm going to try and do something different i wrote the first draft as if it was itself a play in other words, as if I was, you know, writing a a, and a theater play, uh, which I'm not an expert in at all, um, is quite similar to like a screenplay for a TV show or a, or a, um, or a movie. And so I literally thought, sat down and wrote it as a screenplay, where you know you write scene one, you know, 
in you know exterior city streets daytime and just and you're writing it almost entirely as dialogue except for little action lines um and so i that allowed me to write the story very very quickly at first where i could get into all of these really exciting settings and different places and and focusing in on a lot of the dialogue because of course when you're dealing with theater actors um in, in especially in the context of this world where it's almost quite Shakespearean the way that the the plays are performed. Uh, you have to really focus in on sharp dialogue and wit and things like that. And so writing that first draft as if it was actually going to be a play or a movie allowed me to, to move very quickly through all of the action of the story. And then I wrote it as the novel itself. And that took uh, quite a few drafts, um, which is always the case when I'm writing uh, Great Coats books um, or books set in the world of the, the Great Coats, these swashbuckling traveling magistrates. Those always take um, quite a few drafts compared to, for example, um, a book like uh, the Spellslinger books, where those I always write almost entirely as one draft. It's one go and it just kind of has a, it comes together because it's so, it's such an intimate viewpoint. It's not always dealing with 10 different sort of characters and forms of intrigue. And so even though Play of Shadows is told entirely from the point of view of our hero, Damalas, um, it's still uh, got so many th threads and strands going on that it takes a while to make sure that they all sort of line up perfectly. But that was what made that process different, was actually writing a novel first as a screenplay and then making it the novel, even though, of course, I'm not a screenwriter. I, I've never aspired to uh, when I've when I've done screenwriting for um, for people who just because they happen to have asked me to do so or hired me to do something like that, whether it be for, um, you know, movies or, or video games or things like that. Uh, it's very much a different process for me. So that so it was kind of interesting to take some of what I learned in that process and bring it into the novel writing process this time. Very well said. Mr. Sebastian, so did you face significant challenges along the way? There were, so the, the, the significant challenges that were unusual, and I think this is something that probably a lot of readers don't encounter very much. Because when a reader gets a book, they're getting the finished version of the book. They're getting the version that the, that the, that the author and the editors and the publishers and the marketing people that everyone agrees this is the version of the book um and this is the right version and this is the the best version of the book and it, and it feels as if well that was always going to be whatever that story is that was the story but in the case of play of shadows i first started writing this book in about 2018 and it was originally going to come out i think in 2020 and i done the draft and my, my editor was uh, very pleased with it. Um, but of course, we had lots of things that happened as a result of the pandemic where, you know, books would be delayed and, and we'd be thinking about different ways of approaching this new series, The Court of Shadows, of which this is the first book. Um, and so there would be these these delays. And every time there was a delay, I would sort of go, well, you know what, since we're delaying publication, I'm going to take another look at the draft. I'm going to go through it one more time. and. Uh, my editor would sort of say, well, you don't need to, we're happy with it. And I'd go, well, but let me take a look. And I'd take a look and, and it would feel like, you know, something's changed. And, and if you think about the, the time period of the pandemic, of course, it felt like things were changing all the time. And in fact, in 2020 itself, um, I, I felt like a lot of things had changed in our culture and, and what what questions we were asking ourselves. And so that actually changed quite a bit of the book, it changed the ending of the book. Um, because it felt there was, there was an ending that when I first wrote it in 2018, 2019 felt, well, that feels like that feels right. That feels natural, but books are always in one sense or another, if not a reflection of our culture at the moment, they're certainly, um, in dialogue with our culture at the moment, our, our, our books, when we're reading a story, they are having a kind of a conversation inside of our minds with the rest of the world around us. How different is this story from what I see in the world around me um, in terms of its values, in terms of what it's saying? And so because of all those changes, every time that happened, I was actually making changes to the book. Um, and I remember one big change, which happened fairly late in the process. Um, I'd originally written the novel in third person. 
Um, so for, for, for people who don't think about this kind of stuff, third person just means you're writing it at a certain distance. You're, you know, you say he ran into the room and he saw the gun and he picked it up. Um, when you're writing in first person, you're saying, I ran into the room, I saw the gun and I picked it up. Um, almost all of my books are written in first person, but Play of Shadows was one that was actually originally written in third person. And at one point I just, I, I just wanted to experiment with it. And when I, started i rewrote the first chapter that way and instantly it changed the flavor of the book and and it changed it in a way that felt that felt even better to me and so i had to go through a process of rewriting um the entire book into first person you would think that isn't a big change but it's actually a very big change when you write in third person you don't always have to um, convey the character's thoughts and feelings about something so you know you can have you can say you know um uh Daniel uh, walked into the bar and someone threw a punch and hit him in the jaw and Daniel clenched his fist and punched the guy right back. Um, and that all can kind of feel perfectly fine like that. But if you write it in the first person, I walked into the bar and this guy punched me in the face. So I punched him right back. You're going to feel like, well, there's something missing. Like, what did it feel like to be punched in the face? What, what anger did that spur? And so you have to then write in a much more because you're forced to bring out those feelings and reactions more explicitly to the reader because you're you're making the reader the character the character the, the reader wants to know what's happening inside not just outside um you then have to be very efficient with everything else so that the book doesn't just become overly long so so those were the kind of the things that made it unusual um that that you know because the publication was delayed a lot our culture, our existence changed, and that meant that the story changed along with it, and then that shift into first person. But what, one of the things that was interesting was that it was never, this was never kind of um, hard work or never, you know, because I, when I describe all those changes, it makes it sound like, oh, good, that's just so much work, especially when you compare, you know, a book like, um, you know, Fate of the Argosy, which is one of my Argosy novels, which, you know, I write, I wrote in a month, and I absolutely adore that book, and I think it's one of my best books. But in fact, this was never hard work because there's something about writing in a setting like the theater with these with a cast of really misbegotten actors you know these very funny flamboyant actors um with all of their insecurities and their arrogances and 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 all of those things that just make it fun to delve back into that world and be with them again so it was it had challenges but they were always fun challenges to face how did you come up with the title play of shadows and what does it signify well the series itself is called the court of shadows and one of the reasons why shadows is such an important concept in this new fantasy series is because i wanted to write about a set of threats to a country that are very difficult to perceive at first you see the effects but you don't know where it's coming from. There's no, there's no immediate enemy that declares war or no evil villain that, you know, stands on top of a mountain and gives a speech. Um, things are happening and the characters all over this country who are trying to protect that country aren't quite sure where they're coming from. It's all, it's that, that effect of all those shadows. Um, and so that was very important to me because <clears throat> quite often in fantasy, we make our heroes and villains very clear. You know, we just, we make the threats very obvious. But in, in the world that, that you and I live in now, it's never very clear where the threats are really coming from. Sometimes we, we think we know, but we're not sure. And we only find out later that, for example, you know, a giant social conflict on Twitter, for example, that may have all kinds of people who live in the same country fighting one another, it actually originates from somewhere else where it's a it's a scheme by some other country or some other group to in, in, to foment um uh incivility and and division and so shadows are very important in this book um and of course part of the key to this story to unlocking the 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 mystery that takes place that combines events taking a hundred years in the past in the story with those taking place in the present of the story 
comes out through this play, through this theater play that they are that every time they perform a new act of the play, it, it they discover new things. And so, Play of Shadows made a lot of sense to me. Um, I have to uh, I have to thank my my friend Julie Zerneda, who wrote a wonderful book called A Play of Shadow in her fantasy series, which is uh, very different. But um, but yeah, that became. Uh, it just felt like the exact title for this book. It is a play of shadows. Interesting, Mr. Sebastian. But before we go on, we want to shout out our listeners in Denmark. Thank you, Denmark, for supporting this podcast. Because in Capital Region, we got 54% audience share. South Denmark, 21. North Denmark, 16. Zealand, 4. And Central Jutland, 4%. Again, thank you so much for supporting this podcast because this podcast is great to empower writers, authors all over the world, like Mr. Sebastian D. Castell. And thank you, Fitchpot, for being number four for be- being best book podcast on the planet. So, Mr. Sebastian, did you draw from any personal experiences when crafting the story or characters of Play of Shadows? Yeah, in fact, the the dedication, uh, the dedication in Play of Shadows. I put a dedication in all my books because um, I always find it interesting to it, it as a means of both of thanking people who've been important to me, but also, um, but also connecting those the experiences I've had with those people with the book. And so the dedication in Play of Shadows is for the dashing and dauntless cast and crew of the Bloomsbury Theaters 2000. And, uh, for production of Richard the Third, you were Varistor's one and all. So a Varistor in the world of this uh, of Play of Shadows is uh, as a special kind of actor. It's the it's the actors who are believed to have this ability to channel the historical figures that they play on stage. And so uh, about twenty years ago, I was doing uh, fight choreography for theater productions, and I was doing one in London in England uh, for this very daring production of Richard the Third. And what made this production different was rather than basing it on the Shakespeare production, which is the one everyone's familiar with, in which Richard III is this hunchback, evil, manipulative, scheming murderer, um, they were focusing on the historical Richard III, who was a very different figure. I'm not saying he was a heroic figure, but most kings and queens of England weren't actually all that heroic when you put them in context. They were much more complicated. And so this production, which had all of these wonderful fight scenes in it that I was I was uh, honored to be able to choreograph some of them along with a, a, a fellow choreographer and friend of mine, um, Jessica Lee uh, clark Bojan. Um this play had this very different take. It was trying to show the true Richard that had been obscured by Shakespeare's uh, wonderful uh, historical play. And so that experience is very much part of what comes to pass in Play of Shadows. In Play of Shadows, we have a very famous uh, play about one of the most heroic figures, legendary figures in in, in that uh, that country's past. Uh, facing off against one of the most notorious villains and murderers in that country's past. And what the play starts to reveal because of this magic that infects this poor, hapless actor, Damalas, um, is that nothing that they believe that took place in the past happened the way that they did. And because that um, that story, like so many of our stories, was so critical to the way people see themselves in the present of that world, um, the fact of cha- of of making it as if maybe that story wasn't didn't happen the way they believed changes everything. For example, if you think of I don't know, I'm gonna I'll, I'll, I'm Canadian, so I'll pick on the United States, uh, our, our friends to the south. Um, George Washington is a very crucial figure for them, and George Washington's honor and heroism are very crucial for them, as is the honor and heroism of, for example, an, an Abraham Lincoln. Now. Uh, Benedict Arnold is a traitor for them, uh, you know, uh, and and for good reason. Imagine a play that suddenly made it seem as if George Washington wasn't heroic at all, and if Benedict uh, Arnold perhaps was, uh, that would cause quite a stir because it's not just affecting the past; it's affecting how people see themselves in the present, and so seeing how that play uh, that version of Richard the Third that I was 
honored to choreograph in London uh, 20 years ago, how that was affecting the people watching it was part of what I brought into Play of Shadows when I was sort of exploring a different story whose uh, who's possible uh, differences from the way it's been portrayed could affect the culture. And I think we see that we see that unfolding in our own world all the time. There is a constant fight within different social groups and cultural groups over the truth of what happened in the past, whether, you know, it was this, you know, the one person that we believed was a hero of a moment, or was it actually someone else? And those fights are playing out all the time. And so I think that's what makes Play of Shadows kind of a timely book, not for trying to correct our world or our present, but for enabling a reader to enjoy a, a fun swashbuckling story with you know, sword fights and humor and things like that, but to actually feel a sense of comfort in recognizing that those conflicts over stories and what stories mean to our world in the present, um, dealing with those as we see them unfold for us today. Well done, Mr. Sebastian. So what do you hope readers will take away from Play of Shadows after Phoenix reading it? I hope one of the things they'll take away is this sense that um, the, a, a sense that we don't always know what our past really is, and that when we become obsessed with relying on a supposed historical event as the basis for our decisions in the present, as the basis for our sense of who we are in the present, we make ourselves somewhat weaker. Um, we make ourselves vulnerable because if it turns out that story is not true, then that suddenly feels like everything falls out beneath our feet. And I see a lot of that today. I see a lot of vulnerability in, in, in that today. I don't want to delve into current social conflicts, but I will give this one example and I'll try to do it without, without in any way taking sides or making anyone feel like they should take sides. Um, I see, I meet people all the time for whom the Harry Potter books were an absolutely crucial part of their childhood or, or even their adulthood, where they'll say those books saved my life. They made me feel okay to be different. And now, of course, J.K. Rowling is, 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 is somewhat embroiled in a controversy around uh, trans identity and trans rights and, and gender identity. And a lot of those people now feel as if, well, now that story's taken away from me. Now I, I, I feel like my childhood was a lie. I feel, and I don't want people to feel that way. I don't think we should be vulnerable to those things. And so I hope when reading Play of Shadows and seeing how easily the way that we present stories from the past can be used to manipulate our sense of ourselves in the present, they'll come away feeling like, you know what? I can love a story and not be bound to it and not be captured in the mythology of it. Um, so I think that's very important to me. And I also hope that when, that as after people read this book, mostly I hope that they're just going to enjoy it. But, but after they read this book, I hope that when they see politicians referring to the mythical past, even when the mythical past is only 20 years ago or 30 or 40 years ago, uh, and when they see Uh, other people trying to use that past as a means of defining the present, of controlling who we are or should be in the present, that they will be at least a little more skeptical and uh, maybe crack a joke the way that Damalas or Barreto or Abistrini or the other characters in Play of Shadows do, because they'll have, uh, they'll be a bit more conscious of the fact that um, stories shouldn't be used as tools of control against the rest of us in the present. They should be whatever they are. They can be mythical, legendary. They can be 100% accurate, but they are not the things that define who we are and what we should do today. Yes, indeed. So were there any particular authors or books that influence your writing style or content of Play of Shadows? Well, as you know, we've we've talked about this in the past a little bit. My my writing style is is drawn from a lot of different authors, uh, and playwrights, and TV writers, and even comic book writers. Uh, Brian Michael Bendis. I used to love the way he would make kind of almost mythical superheroic characters feel very very human. Um, in the case of Play of Shadows, there were a, a few different things that 
came into play, one of which was actually a film that um, that's based on a play uh, that I adore called um, Shakespeare in Love. Uh, so if you haven't seen Shakespeare in Love, it's a, it's a very fun uh, pl- uh, movie. Um, it's about uh, it's about uh, William Shakespeare and this attempt to put to write and put on the first uh, production of Romeo and Juliet in the in the Tudor period in England. Um, and a lot of the sense of kind of magic and wonder of the theater um, and the, 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 the backbiting and the internal conflicts and the camaraderie, it all comes out in there. And so um, I frequently found myself uh, thinking back to that movie as I was writing Play of Shadows, even though Play of Shadows, of course, is a fantasy. It's set in a different world. It's a lot more sword fights and swashbuckling and things like that. Um, but I certainly think if, if people enjoy Play of Shadows and they want to connect a bit with um, some of the, the ideas of what goes into theater plays and, and all the strange uh, conflicts and battles and, and, and almost duels that took place when, when these productions were made, uh, they should run out and watch, um, and watch Shakespeare in Love uh, because the, it was a, yeah, it's a, it's a really fun time. And also just um, if, if you haven't been to a theater play for a while, um, you know, my, my wife and I go and we see quite a bit of theater, especially when we're in London. London happens to be a wonderful place to see theater. Um, and But I find even sometimes when you go and see community theater or high school theater, there's always a moment. In fact, in some ways, it's almost easier with community theater. I always say, like, it's in some ways, it's easier to, to enjoy community theater. When you watch professional theater, the things that stick out to you tend to be when when an actor flubs a line or when something doesn't feel very well performed or something. You, you, you expect it to be perfect. And so when it's not, it sort of bothers you. When you watch sort of community theater, amateur theater, you kind of have this different expectation. But sometimes, but always at some point in the in the play, some of the actors will transcend our expectations, and in those moments, it feels quite inspired, and you find yourself kind of wanting to cheer for the actor. Um, and so, I think that's an, that's another place where I draw uh, inspiration from, and I hope uh, people who enjoy Play of Shadows will as well. Definitely. But before we go on, Mr. Sebastian, please do listen to my other podcast, Food 101, our fourth season with Chef Alessandro, one of the best executive chef in one of the five-star hotels in downtown Toronto. Please do listen to our latest episode. We talk about our culinary courses, people. Food 101 culinary courses. Please purchase them and you will learn how to create a delicious food. So, Mr. Sebastian, can you read one of your favorite chapter of Play of Shadows? Uh, well, I don't think you'd want me to read a whole chapter because they're very long, but um, I'll be happy to to give a quick read of a few pages of the first uh, of the first chapter. I'm getting old now, so I'm going to put on my glasses. Um, So Play of Shadows, Chapter 1, Rabbit, Rabbit. Everyone has a talent, and these days, mine is running. So superb is my aptitude for panicked flight that it almost makes up for my less admirable traits, which include cowardice, poor fencing skills, and a regrettable tendency to forget those faults while making bold threats against brutish thugs who suffer no such deficiencies of their own. Run, rabbit, run! My pursuers cheered as they chased me through bustling streets and abandoned alleyways, over one crowded canal bridge and across the next. Run down your warren! Run up the hill! Run from the vixen before she makes her kill! The vixen. Of all the sobriquets adopted by professional duelists in the city of Jurest, surely Lady Ferica de Trezzo's was the most apt and the most terrifying. I dived under a fruit seller's stall, rolled up to my feet on the other side, and kept on running. What had possessed me to go on it to go and challenge the deadliest fencer in the entire city to a duella honoria? Faster, rabbit, faster! You're the one she's after! Damn their tune for being so catchy! Merchants shuttering their shops for the night sang along. Scampering children trying to run between my legs giggled their way through their own mangled lyrics. I had to shove aside two lovers out for a romantic stroll as they hummed the melody while gazing soulfully into each other's eyes. I dashed through the overcrowded square and into an equally con- congested courtyard, doing my best to avoid those among my fellow citizens who saw it as their duty to stick out a foot and trip me in anticipation of witnessing a good beating before I was dragged back to court. 
I'd been keeping up a goodly pace thus far, but I was tiring, and my tormentors knew it. Hide, rabbit, hide, the black-shirted bravos chanted as they closed in on me. She's searching far and wide. When I dared glance back, I caught the flickering light of the brass street lanterns glinting off the metal orchid emblems on their collars. The iron orchids called themselves a citizen militia, determined to rid the city of petty criminals and other undesirables. But mostly, they were street toughs who sold their services to anyone looking to settle a grudge. Alas, Jurest's uh, notoriously feckless constabulary did little to curb their activities. An orchestra of swashing and clanging accompanied my pursuers as the small buckler shields slung low on their leather belts banged against the scabbarded steel hilts of their rapiers and side swords. The thump of booted heels on the loose cobblestone streets added an ominous rhythm section. Saint Ethalia who shares all sorrows, I swore silently. Help me escape these mercenary thugs. They're going to hold me back to court and dump me in the dueling circle so that fox-faced lunatic who calls herself the vixen could stick her blade through my heart before mine even leaves its scabbard. The iron orchids were herding me deeper and deeper into the narrow alleys of the pauper's market, apparently determined to keep me from the temple district where I might beg sanctuary. Fortunately for me, I'd no intention of sleeping in a church tonight. Run down your hole, rabbit, run up the sky. Run a little faster, or else you'll surely die. Coming through, I shouted to a pair of street cleaners wrestling a stinking refuse cart across the street. Grinning in reply, they pushed all the harder to cut me off. No doubt they were hoping for a reward for my pursuers. A coward fleeing a lawful duel always means plenty of coin to go around for those who help bring the fugitive to justice. Desperation lent my legs the extra ounce of strength I needed to leap high enough for my right foot to catch the top of the wagon's iron-banded wheel. My left found purchase on the edge of the coffin-sized refuse box, but as I jumped across, my toe caught on the opposite edge and I tumbled headlong towards the cobblestones below. Luck, more than skill, sent me into a somersault that saved my skull, but it came at the cost of a numb shoulder and an unsettling twinge in my ankle. I started for the nearest alley, my chest heaving now. If any iron orchids thought to circle round and beat me to the other side, I'd be trapped. But I had more pressing problems, as it turned out, because my next step had me hissing through my teeth, and the one after that tore a howl from me. I'd sprained my ankle, and my race was done. I'll stop there because I don't want to... Bravo! Bravo, Mr. Sebastian! Rabbit! Rabbit! And can you please invite our listeners to support all your books? Sure, yeah. If uh, if you're new to my work, um, a good place to start is a book called Trader's Blade. That's a swashbuckling fantasy uh, series uh, book for adults. It was my debut novel and it launched my career. And it's part of a four book series called The Great Coats. And all of those are published. I know some readers um, don't like to pick up a new series and, and then not be able to finish it. Um, and so the whole Great Coats Quartet is done. If you like more young adult uh, fantasy with lots of magic and trickery and things like that, the Spell Slinger series is a six book series. It's complete as well. You can read all those. Um, there's also the Argosy series that's out that has uh, three books out now. So if you like um, young adult fantasy, but you prefer a female protagonist that features various Parfax, who's one of my absolute favorite characters to write. If you like wizards going around blowing things up and swearing all the time, Malevolent 7 is the book for you. If you like, uh, if you'd like to see a swashbuckling Hercule Poirot meets the X-Files, uh, investigating supernatural murders in a monastery, uh, try Crucible of Chaos. Um, but of course, if you've never read anything of mine and you're intrigued by Play of Shadows, you can absolutely easily um, pick up this book uh, and read it, having never read any of the other things, uh, other books I've written. Um, I make it a point of pride to try to write my books so that no matter which one you pick up first, you can start there. You'll never be lost or have to run back and read something else first. And uh, and finally, if you want to uh, say hi to me, my website is decastel.com. It's D-E-C-A-S-T-E-L-L.com. I'm very easy to find. There's a contact form on the site. So if you want to send an email, if you've enjoyed one of the books, or if you haven't enjoyed one of the books and want to tell me about it, 
Uh, I make it a point of pride to reply to all the emails I get. I get a lot of them, so I can't always do it right away, but you'll always get an answer from me unless your email makes it sound like you're a Nigerian prince offering me $10 million. <laughs> Definitely, you please people still support uh, Mr. Sebastian de Castel because if you support him, more, more, more books to come. And thank you for your talents that you shared to us. So, Mr. Sebastian, thank you for your time. Thank you, Daniel. More to come, people. See you soon. <laughs>